Hi, this is Scott. I really appreciate our sponsors because they make the show possible. Today's show is sponsored by Telerik. Create compelling app experiences across any screen with the Telerik platform. Telerik's end-to-end platform uniquely combines industry-leading UI tools with cloud services to simplify the entire app development cycle. Telerik offers everything .NET developers need to build quality apps faster. Try it free at Telerik.com slash platform. That's Telerik.com slash platform. From HanselMinutes.com, it's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 517. In this episode, Scott talks with Captain Brent Chapman, who works for the new Defense Innovation Unit Experimental at Moffett Field, California. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today, I'm talking with Captain Brent Chapman. Uh, and uh, you were a research scientist at the R.B. Seimer Institute, but now you've just moved. I'm talking to you from your new location. That's right. I'm now in uh, Moffett Field, California, at the new Defense Innovation Unit Experimental. That's very exciting. Congratulations. Thank you. So, uh, it sounds like the Army is getting into uh, to cyber things. You were at the Army Cyber Institute. I didn't know we had one of those. We did a fairly new organization, only a few years old, and it sort of uh, follows the same timeline as the new, the Army's newest branch, which is the Cyber Warfare Branch. Uh, so after about 17 years or so, Army finally decided to create a new branch specifically focused on uh, generating effects and conducting operations in cyberspace. That's very cool. I want to I want to dig into that. And I want to find out about how that, as long as as well as your journey to be a maker. But let's let's back up because I went over to your. Uh, your website, your own personal website, which is at brentmorelabs.com. And it's just a great site with blog posts and projects and YouTube videos and stuff that you've done at Maker Fair and all these kind of things. It sounds like you've been tinkering since day one. I have been, yeah. It's, it's sort of my, my number one hobby, uh, taking things apart, sometimes putting them back together. Uh, but really, it's all about sort of creation uh, with tech and with building a sort of uh, a way to express myself, um, you know, sort of artistically too. Mm-hmm. When did you when did you start? Were you taking things apart as a toddler? Oh yeah. So my I'd say it goes back as you know when I first moved to the states. Uh, my family and I immigrated to the U.S. Uh, when I was four uh, from South America, a little small a small country called Guyana, mm-hmm. and we moved to the city, New York City. And I remember seeing my first piece in technology. In fact, it was a, it was a radio, and just thinking like, wow, this is. This is magic. I, you know, it sort of blew my mind. And, and, you know, so I thought, so the next step for me was like, well, how, do, how does it work? I want to mm-hmm. get into this thing. Um, so I grabbed my, my dad was a carpenter, right? So he had his whole suite of tools. And sure enough, I made my way over to that toolbox and grabbed the screwdriver. And, and that's how, was, how it all began. How do, why do you think people do that? Like, why are there people who want to take the toaster apart and other people just accept that the toaster makes toast? I don't know. It's a, it's a, something that I kind of think about to this very day, especially as it relates to my work. You know, I, uh, we have a lot of products that are presented to us, uh, with a set of capabilities. And sometimes, you know, we want to do something just, just slightly different than what it's, uh, built to do mm-hmm. or marketed to do. Uh, but so it's kind of frustrating to, to know that, oh, you're so close, but, you know, if I could only tweak this one thing or add this one thing, you know, it'd be, this would be a perfect thing. And so for me, that's a huge motivation. Uh, and I think that, yeah, certainly I wasn't thinking about that when I was four, but it's, it's sort of evolved and matured into that, uh, to this day. So I like to see possibilities rather than the products. You know, I like to, to see what else a cell phone is capable of doing. You know, it can, it can be a remote, it can be a flashlight. You know, we, we know, we know all these things. Um, but taking that mindset to almost everything on a, on a daily basis for me is kind of exciting. Mm-hmm. When we're trying to encourage people to be makers and trying to encourage people to explore, um, how important is it to teach people that mindset of, you know, go and think about systems and go and think about opening up, you know, things that you already have and take apart stuff. Don't be afraid of it. How important is it that we instill that into, into beginners and makers? You know, I think it's critical. You know, I talked to some of my friends and, uh, who, you know, who have, uh, they can remember back to their granddad, you mm-hmm. know, who loved getting his hands dirty and fixing something whatever it was, whether it was a car or some type of electronics. And he, that granddad sort of always knew 
uh, or, you know, how things worked or his first step when something was broken was to sort of just get in there. And, you know, but when I talk to my friend, you know, in this case, it's, it's, well, why don't you do this? And they're sort of afraid. They're sort of, they've been growing up with, uh, p- products with planned obsolescence, you know, products, uh, that are, that intimidate them. And so they've sort of lost that spirit of getting into things and trying to, to fix it first. Now it's more, if something doesn't work, you just sort of get rid of it and buy the new thing. And for me, it's critical when I educate or when I, uh, you know, when I do my daily duties as a cyber warfare officer, I think it's critical to, to sort of get back to that and understand how systems work, uh, knowing what you can do, knowing what rules you can bend, what rules you can break, uh, in order to maneuver around the system um, and to be more efficient about uh, the way we go about things. Mm-hmm. You said that your your dad was a carpenter and you were doing this from age four and you were using his tools. I can assume that they encouraged you in this uh, in this direction. Uh, not so much. <laughs> I hmm. was actually kind of a, uh, uh, you know, I was like, uh, my, my brother absolutely hated me um, because <laughs> when, whenever he got a new toy, he sort of knew what that really meant. Um, that oh, I got yeah, a, I got a new I got a new experiment. Yeah, later that night. <laughs> uh, so. You know, and that's not really that strange, you know, in, in, in popular culture, like the maker or the hacker, you know, if you look at it mm-hmm. from the computer security point of view, was sort of villainized forever from, um, and it's really only until fairly recently that it's now be, sort of become the cool thing with, you know, you can see the evidence in you know, popular culture with shows like Mr. Robot, where it's now like the cool thing to be the, the one who knows how systems work and how to bend these rules. So growing mm-hmm. up, it was kind of the same thing with me. Yeah. You know, I was, I was sort of the, uh, not the wild kid, but just like the, I was destructive rather than curious is how they saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I struggle with that a little bit. You know, every generation has their idea of what a hacker is, but like I was more of a phone person, right? Remember mm-hmm. phone freaking and things oh, yeah. like that. 2600. Trying to figure yeah. Out, yeah. And trying to figure out what, you know, what those tones meant. And when someone came and poked around on the phone system, they would plug their wires in and start sending tones down and you realize you could get free long distance. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I uh, someone told me I was voted most likely to be convicted of a white collar crime. Oh, ouch! Yeah, not, not not the kind of thing you want to be thought of at school. You know, I I look back to my like my teenage days, and I was certainly you know I was I was in the gray space, if you will. Right? I think I've atoned for that. I've I've done my service now, and I've, I'm all good. But mm-hmm. uh, you know that that curiosity um, you know, at the time as a teenager, you know, you certainly don't fully grasp the. The, the legalities and, and policy, policy-wise, you know, what you should and shouldn't be doing on on other people's networks, but uh, you know, I was curious and I wanted to see, you know see how far I could push things before um, they sort of blew up in my face. Uh, I, I've definitely toned it down and matured quite a bit now, um, but I think still that spirit is so important into in getting that across to kids that it's okay to experiment within reason, uh, you know, to to want to be curious to find out how things work. And and sometimes that involves taking things apart, mm-hmm. and and exploring boundaries, which which actually brings me to kind of an interesting, if not a little bit uh, complicated question. I hope you don't mind. If you were, if you're a security person, if you're a maker, if you're an explorer, you're going to push boundaries. But I don't think of the army or the military as being a boundary pushing place. Is it hard to to balance those two aspects of your personality? It is, you know, and I. I aim to strike a, a nice balance on a daily basis. You know, the military, as you could imagine, is um, built and has been successful, especially, you know, the U.S. military has been very successful in uh, working at scale and being very efficient at scale because mm-hmm. of the rules and the policies and procedures in place. Um, mm-hmm. So something like uh, making or hacking or even cyber operations, you know, there's some skills or some mindsets that are fundamentally at odds with that traditional military mindset. And so there's friction on almost a daily basis. And you know, if you design a system, for example, a military system, you can expect there to be lots and lots of rules. But if you're conducting cyber operations, even, you know, defense, you may need to bend those rules in order to come up with an optimal outcome. Uh, and with those two things at odds, you can see how it's very sort of can be frustrating at times. Um, to, because you want to be good, you want to be good at what you do, and you want to um, have fun and keep people safe. But sometimes we get in our own way um, from the military point of view. Yeah, definitely. It seems like the mindset for being a good hacker is different from perhaps being a good soldier. But finding that balance is what what you what you're trying to accomplish right now. That's right. 
Yeah. And uh, so when you think about making and stuff and doing you know work, I know that you did work with uh, Maker Fair and you've published lots of Maker projects on your on your blog and on your site. Is that something that you can do on the side? Do you just tell the bosses at the Army, like, hey, I'm going to go to speak at MakerCon this year? How does that work? Yeah, I think there's been a, a really – I've been fortunate in that uh, my last job at uh, the U.S. Military Academy um, at West Point – in the Army Cyber Institute and here at the Defense Innovation Unit Experimental, you know, my, my bosses see this as a, a great thing because our, you know, their goal in, in both organizations was uh, outreach, finding out ways to get the DOD, specifically the Army, you know, mm-hmm. back to the cutting edge where we used to be. And we sort of lost that luster and lost that edge over the many decades of um, conflict of incredible influence by the defense industrial base. You know, you can, you can sort of think of the large defense contractors and defense companies. Mm-hmm. And we want to, we want to get back to a better relationship, a more productive relationship, uh, with, with the public. So when they see, you know, that I'm willing on, and I, I have the interest and I'm willing to on a weekend or over the summer or what have you go to the maker fairs and the maker cons, uh, go down to visit Adafruit, New York, for example, see mm-hmm. these maker spaces, see the, who the Titans are and want to create these relationships and strengthen these relationships. They think it's a great thing. So I'm going to keep doing it uh, while, as long as they let me. Yeah. I saw on your, on your blog that you got some pretty, pretty sweet uh, invites. Not only did you go like to Adafruit, but you also saw a, a tour of the MIT media lab. I didn't. And uh, in fact, that was, uh, I was actually going as a prospective student for that visit. So that was oh, kind of wow. neat. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, the Media Lab is one of the few places, as you, as you know, in, in the country where it's, you have this really nice uh, mix of tech and arts and math and engineering. Um, but, and, you know, they've had quite a history and they've been, they've been doing it very successfully for a long time. Mm-hmm. So you're able to balance all of this. You're doing work. You're doing, you're doing your, your, your job. Yep. You uh, are a fairly recent uh, master's degree graduate from Carnegie Mellon, if I, don't, if I understand it correctly. Uh, how are you managing all of this at the same time? I know that I just, it's, it's all I can do to do a podcast, have a full time job and get the occasional Arduino project done. Uh, how are you managing all of this 26 hours a day? Yeah. Well, I think the key is that I, I love everything that I do, right? I love my job. I love uh, what I do. Um, in the military. I love what I do in my garage or my basement, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I love learning. And so it all is not really work for me. You know, I I don't, I don't really, I haven't worked a day in my life, right? (laughs) So, so I'm, I'm fortunate that way. I know a lot of folks, uh, really don't have that luxury, but it's, it's worked out for me so far. Mm -hmm. Um, so thinking about some of the, the tools that you're using, um, you know, I, I was talking to someone recently who was working on a, a, a movie or a TV show and they're, you know, doing techie type stuff. And we joke sometimes as techies about how uncomfortable the dialogue is in, in, in TV shows, except for, of course, Mr. Robot that you uh, pointed out is one of the, the great shining examples of tech done right on TV. And, uh, someone used the term, uh, military grade. Which makes me always think about like that rugged Panasonic tough book. You know what I mean? When I oh, think about yeah. military that's, that's almost like, unusable. Yeah. You're right. <laughs> but, um, I realized that in the last five to 10 years, like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis and these small, tiny devices kind of came up. Is that something that, that was, was around? Did we have these miniaturized full spec computers before or, and has that changed? Is that something the army is aware of? Is the military realizing that computers can be, you know, hidden under someone's tongue? Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You have, uh, you know, so these have, this has been a fairly recent phenomenon, these sort of microcomputers, microcontrollers, right. um, at, at the price point, right? I mean, they've been around for a while, but just pro- prohibitively expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, and the military is certainly aware of these, but it's, you got to think about it from you know, the military acquisition process is something that is, you know, I don't wish upon my worst enemy having to go through. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we, we look at a piece of X, so whether it's a tank or a, a, a fighter jet or a helicopter, or a computer. And mm-hmm. we say, well, we need, we need this thing to do these, uh, number of tasks. Mm-hmm. And so we spend some time making this list of tasks that this device is supposed to do, right? A mm-hmm. tank is supposed to be able to withstand so many rounds or this type of, you know, concussion. Right. Of uh, force. Uh, and so we spend some time writing these tasks and what we want this tank to look like. And this takes a lot of time. Then we have to, you know, bid it out and get someone to build it. And these things take years and years and years. Mm. The military has tried to apply that same sort of scheduling and, and construct to technology, 
you know, like sort of lower end technology, if you think about it, to computers, to desktop computers, right. to microprocessors, microcontrollers. And it just doesn't work because in the same eight years that it takes you to, you know, as you would a tank in terms of setting everything up, you know, in that same eight years, this is, you know, Moore's law comes into effect several times over. And that in device that you initially sort of made the list of, of, of competencies um, and, and bid out for and wrote this contract for is now obsolete several times over. Mm-hmm. So we've got to, as a DOD, um, come up with uh, an alternative um, to an ex- you know, something that works well for you know, for certain types of acquisitions. But we need to come up with an alternative, specifically focused on this tech. So we're aware that it's out there, uh, but we have to fix the system on how we actually acquire it um, for use in in the in DOD. Hey folks, I wanted to take a moment to tell you about Raygun and their new product called Pulse. Raygun is an error and crash reporting software provider, and their new product, Pulse, it's a real-time user monitoring product. It gives you performance data and user insights. lets you understand exactly what's happening when users interact with your software, so you're never left guessing. Raygun provides you with the answers to your performance questions, and they've found over 10 billion, that's billion with a B, bugs in customer apps with their crash reporting product and now raygun will help you understand application quality like no one else over 30,000 developers worldwide can't be wrong i use raygun all the time and i enjoy it very much you can try it out today with a no risk 30-day free trial start improving your software quality immediately try raygun for free today at raygun.io I, I was talking to someone from uh, from NASA recently, and they were also talking about the idea of reliability mm-hmm. versus, hey, this is fun and cool and exciting. Uh, you know, there's not a Raspberry Pi sitting on a Mars lander robot yeah, because yeah. not only is it there's the acquisition that takes years, but also that we don't know if that's a reliable thing. Yeah, don't but get me we wrong. do know that uh, we do know a 46 is an extremely reliable thing. So that's yeah. why 486 processors go to space. Yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's uh, there are reasons and there there are great upsides as to why we have this rugged, ru- this um, rigid process rather, uh, and, the, and that's you know perhaps a good thing about the bureaucracy. Yeah, is absolutely. That we, you know, we're guaranteed that the thing or. <laughs> We're, we're, uh, we're confident that the um, device is going to perform as was described to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, I think they're, you know, that works. But what if, you know, at the, at the price points for some of these devices, maybe you don't need it to work 100% of the time. And maybe we shouldn't aim for 100% to be the standard. Perhaps mm. as 80% solution will work if it's cheap enough, right? We right. talk about really obsolescence point. in devices. If this device that does this cool thing um, works 80% of the time, but it costs me $100 to acquire... Well, then I'll just acquire 10 of them instead of buying the to- $1,000 device. Um, that'll take way longer to acquire. Mm-hmm. So that's acquisition when it comes to like official, you know, army type stuff. Mm-hmm. But I understand that you're also m- trying to encourage the creation of maker spaces on post. Are those maker spaces something that people who maybe aren't doing the job that you're doing, like just kind of regular rank and file army people could come and get involved in and learn about making as well? I am. I'm, so I'm, I'm really excited about this initiative. And this is, you know, perhaps this makerspace will be on post. Um, perhaps it'll be just off post in, you know, in the community, because after all, we're trying to, uh, help form better relationships between the military and the public. So perhaps mm-hmm. being off post might be a better option just for folks to get visibility on service members and sort of see that service members are people too and our makers too, you know, that's kind of fun. And mm-hmm. on, and on the, the converse, you have, you know, service members, uh, folks in the army, for example, learning from the community, because we have a lot of talented engineers and educators and students out there in the community that don't get um, the chance to interface as much as, as we'd like. And we also think it's, it's pretty important to, to look at these maker spaces as perhaps, uh, you know, we have, you know, we have engineers and technicians in the army, but we have some infantrymen, right, that are really technically talented and just didn't know it. That they're yeah, also, they're yeah. makers and they, they're working on their cars and you know what they're making in their free time. They just don't call themselves that. So perhaps this maker space is a way to identify them from an ex- already existing talented pool of, of soldiers and individuals that, um, you know, these folks are out there and this can help highlight some of those skills and make them proud of it. You know, that's really interesting. Th- that term maker, there's been a lot of discussion about that. And there was interestingly a, a medium blog post a couple of days ago where, uh, an individual basically thought that was a bad name, that the term maker put too much emphasis on on creators. Mm-hmm. Like we all have to go out and create and be unique snowflakes and stuff. And sometimes just tearing things apart and plugging them in differently and putting them back together again 
uh, is you know has value as well, or being a really good consumer of something. Yeah. Do you do you think that this term maker is being overused, and that it's there's an is there a negative connotation to it? Is it exclusionary? Um, I don't know. I, this of, of course this might be um, quite biased, but I think that I see nothing but good things um, in the term maker. Uh, it's mm-hmm. I'm seeing it more and more certainly. You know, right. between uh, all the various events from maker media and the publications and, and those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm seeing, fortunately, I'm seeing a, a very positive light on the term maker. Yeah. So yeah, I, I tend to think so as well. I, I don't. I mean, I realize that not everyone can be a, a, a creator, mm-hmm. and I think sometimes people maybe ascribe the you know sense of consumerism and you know ma- when I say maker, I think about solving problems yeah. less than I think about um, creating products to sell. You know what I mean? Yeah, you're making uh, the, you're making products, and you're also making solutions, which are of course less less tangible. Um, you know, ideas are, are hard to get our, our minds around in, in terms of you know when, when you're creating. Something physical, it's, you have a much more visceral reaction, right? Because of course you can handle it and touch it and things like that. But you're sometimes just creating a process, making a new process is almost as valuable. Right. I really like the idea and I'm hoping that my children have the same sense of the, uh, and also my partner, Saran, uh, who I'm working with on with this uh, March is for makers, uh, dot com all the month of March is the idea that, that making something or being able to make something is a sense of power and empowerment. And I think that it would give, young people and people in general, um, for lack of a better word, you know, a straighter back, you walk more tall when you know how to do things, you know, like woodworking is just so visceral. And so you have such a sense of accomplishment. And I feel the same way, whether it be soldering or whatever, you know, and we should all have that feeling of power. I agree. I think it's, uh, you know, one thing I don't, uh, I didn't like as an educator, I didn't like seeing in my classrooms were, you know, the sort of the, uh, the techie student sort of revered for his, his prowess, uh, on the, mm-hmm. whether it's a computer or a phone or, you know, whatever technical thing. Um, and, you know, and as, you know, I'm a technologist at heart, but I still thought that was kind of a negative thing. I wanted my, my English majors and my history majors to be just as involved and just as excited about the possibilities of these wonderful technical tools as this computer scientist was. Right. Exactly. If, imagine what, what we would feel like if, we were talking about being literate, reading, and we, and if someone was a naturally good reader, we would revere them and make the mm-hmm. other kids feel lousy about not reading. And yeah. then eventually the kids would just give up and stop reading altogether. I feel the same thing happens with, with, you know, quote unquote computer people or techies. Or you, you get self identified as a techie. Yeah. And there may be cultural reasons, economic reasons, there could be any number of demographic reasons that may cause you to either be identified or not identified as not being a techie. If we did the same thing to to numeracy or literacy, I think we would be up in arms and we'd say this is unacceptable, but we seem to think it's okay for computer people to do this. Yeah, I think I think we're it's improving though. We're getting to the point where we're realizing as a, as a nation, as a society that, you know, computers and cyber and cybersecurity aren't really technical issues you know there are human issues that are mm. you know and then the computers and our connectivity are the tools behind it so i like looking at a lot of these things that i talk about especially in security from sort of the human lens i mean we can we have all these whiz bang products and the latest and greatest firewalls but at the end of the day you know these are humans using it these are humans making mistakes um and sometimes we're looking to exploit these mistakes um, to our advantage, right? And we're looking to prevent that from the defensive point of view. So if we can learn to appreciate our technical world, um, our technically saturated world from a, more of a human lens, I think we could be better off. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the shows that I did recently uh, that got a lot of uh, people thinking uh, where a, a woman named Keisha Rogers said that we should stop teaching kids how to code and start teaching kids how to think about systems and how systems fit together. Mm-hmm. And that systems level thinking is something that was being completely de-emphasized as we run around frantically trying to get kids to learn Python or four yeah. loops. What do you think about that? I think, I think she's got it. The, our world is obviously becoming much more interconnected, uh, uh, you know, on a day by day basis. We have, you know, the internet of things has been the buzzword for a while. Our computers, phones, fridges, toasters are now interconnected. And, you know, if you told me this 10 years ago, I would have said this. Well, that's ridiculous. Well, imagine, Imagine what the world will look like in 10 years from now. You know, there are, there are things that will be out there that we can't even wrap our heads around right now. But you look, when you sort of take a step back, you realize that these are all systems. These are all many times unique systems that have their own set of rules. And we're finding really, tr- really clever ways of putting them all together, um, 
for hopefully to, to make things easier for us. And so if we can take it from that point of view, understanding that these are system of systems of systems and mm-hmm. seeing what lessons we can learn from that relationship and that inter- interconnectedness, um, I think that's the way to go rather than you know, thinking about it strictly from a low sort of low level technical point of view, understanding what, what they are in terms of systems. It's, a, it's an awesome yeah. thing. I feel like, like layers of abstraction are getting so, the, the layer is so opaque now that people just take certain aspects of technology as just being a miracle. Yeah. You know, you it's know? one of the, uh, one of the downsides of, of, you know, the wonderful products that we get from you know, the, the major companies, uh, tech companies is that, yeah, they make our lives easier, but it's, it's, we're, we're almost becoming numb to the, to, to how incredible, um, uh, uh, this technology really is and how much effort goes on behind it. These, you know, things just work now. You know, when I was growing up, computers didn't just work. There were always, there was always some aspect you had to troubleshoot. And in that troubleshooting process, you were going to learn something for sure. Now things just work. And if they don't work, it's, uh, well, let me just go around and get another or let me restart it or something. And there's no, there's not much learning going on. So if we, if we could force ourselves to, th- to think about what's going on behind the, under the hood, force our students to do the same, I think we'll be much uh, better postured for understanding from a security point of view, why these things fail and what we can do about it. And just from a usability point of view, you know, sort of get a better appreciation of these products. Yeah, I think that's very, very true. Uh, just last week I had, uh, got, I had an iPhone, a new iPhone and, uh, every five minutes, like, like clockwork, it would drop a phone call. Mm-hmm. And I put up with that for a week, not because uh, of any poorly, uh, placed loyalty towards apple but because i really wanted to know why you know is it the is there a loose wire is it a is it a antenna issue and i actually spent a lot of time at the apple store trying to get them to tell me something and they wouldn't go any deeper than yeah that is weird let me go ahead and swap that out for you yeah (laughs) no 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 no. i I really want to sit here and i want to root cause this with you well i don't really want to root cause with you i just want to give you a new phone Mm -hmm. so this went around for a week and uh, a week and basically i just got a new phone so now i will never know why this thing would you know and you'll be thinking about it forever yeah yeah why every five minutes uh but i can't pop the thing open because it's disposable and that's just ridiculous a quad processor uh magical device supercomputer in my pocket that is now disposable yeah uh yeah they just swapped it it was it was surprising so what kinds of uh, I- iot projects are you doing at home i loved exploring on your blog you, you you made your own height adjustable table out of some mahogany and some legs that you got oh yeah you got all sorts of great projects that you're working on what what are you currently tinkering with let's see so um yeah one of my as, as you mentioned one of my favorite things to do is of course tinkering um but i'm i'm also a huge woodworker. So mm-hmm. whenever I can combine the two worlds, you know, I absolutely love it. So I actually built that desk uh, for my wife who is, uh, we have a home office. We've had a home office. She's had a home office for a while. And mm-hmm. so, she, you know, the, the big trend are, you know, these standing desks. So I said, you know, yeah, I, I can make one of those and make it prettier or make it cooler or whatever. So I built one and she's, and she's loved it. But I started to get a little jealous. So just, uh, <laughs> a few months ago, I finished, I finished the second one um, for myself in, in my little, so it's, I've got my soldering station there and everything else. Um, but so whenever I can combine those worlds, I, you know, I absolutely love it. I'm working on right now a, uh, I've got two small dogs, right? And, um, I built a dog house a few years ago. And now that we're back in sunny California, you know, it, it's out there and I think you'll get, they'll get some use out of it. But I, I'm looking at, adding a few sensors to this doghouse so it's sort of uh, the, the the door can open whenever they get nearby you can get some some status updates on where they are exactly if they're sleeping in the doghouse um you know th- th- that sort of thing all maybe powered by a um a raspberry pi i'm not sure yet i haven't selected it mm-hmm. um, but I, you know i love combining all those worlds when you when you pick a project like that like if someone who's listening is thinking like oh that sounds like something that i could do how much time do you spend thinking about you know, the components and having confidence that you can write it from scratch versus seeing if someone else has made a doggy door opener, you know, you know, project all in one. Mm-hmm. It sounds like you're probably more of a looking at a, like what level of Lego piece are you looking for? The complete solution and you follow the instructions or you, are you thinking about wires and chipsets? I think there's, um, I probably, it's probably split for me. You know, of course mm-hmm. the, the first, uh, first thing I do is you know, see what else is out there. I'm not, uh, about to reinvent the wheel if I don't have to. And there are a lot of really talented folks who are, who share freely, of course. And that's the beauty about the, the net is that folks who like to do this tend to document really well. Um, 
and, and their plans and their successes and failures. So that's the first place I look. And sometimes, in fact, you know, I'll have an idea. I'm sure that I want to do a certain thing, but then I'll, I'll look, I'll look online and I'll see you know, some that I hadn't considered. And then, and that in turn can help, in turn can help uh, refine my idea into something, something even greater. Sometimes I do have to sort of roll my own code, right? Or, or invent my own way of doing a certain thing, but that's kind of fun. It always starts out though, seeing, seeing what else is, is out there. And, and, and that's look, the coolest part of the whole learning process, I think. I, I really find more and more that I do solutions that solve a particular problem. Uh, I really admire people who can make art mm-hmm. related installations where they can do something and I'll ask them why they did it and they'll say because it was pretty or because it was mm-hmm. awesome. But for some reason, I keep looking for problems in my house and then wanting to fix them. So like the, the idea of a smart home for pets, that's like, I can get my brain around that and I can jump into that. Yeah. But I don't know if I could do an art installation for, for no other reason that it is pretty. I think that's just how I'm wired for wanting to solve problems. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is that I, I would say that I agree, but I think back to some of my, my projects, um, mm-hmm. that have to do with something artistic. So whether it's a, a sound activated light display or an LED cube or something. And those are actually, you know, yeah. that's art. And I had my fun in terms of soldering all the joints and things like that and planning out the circuits. But in the end, what do these things do? Well, nothing really. They, yeah. but they look pretty. So I, I don't know. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't sell yourself short there. I think you're, you're probably plenty artistic <laughs> if you think about it. Well, like you have a great uh, LED cube number two that you did there, uh, is, uh, that's, that's huge. What do you got? 64 LEDs in, uh, a, in an array? Do you uh, still yep. have that? Do you I do, yeah. It's a, it's a four by four by four and it's sitting on my desk here, on my shelf here. And is and, and it's sound uh, activated as well? Uh, this particular one isn't. I have um, actually the, the table that I described, my, my little soldering, my electronics bench and soldering station. I actually, I glued a strip of LEDs to the back of the table so that when it is sound activated, the light reflects off of my white wall. So it gives mm-hmm. this cool glow. Uh, whenever I'm playing music or, or whatever, uh, it's, it's kind of neat. It's very soothing. You know, if you're putting on some, some jazz or some classical while you're, while you're smelling, uh, you know, solder fumes, it's fun. I, I like, I think I'm going to make the arc reactor that you, that you did a couple, five years ago. Yeah. I, I really like that one because, uh, I was in the middle of Afghanistan for that particular project. And oh, really? yeah, it was, it was in October. So approaching Halloween. And as you can imagine, the, yeah, there's not a whole lot of Halloween party planning in the middle of Afghanistan. Um, mm-hmm. but one thing they do have, there's a lot of like stuff, broken stuff. So whether are there optics from, from, um, aircraft that, were, you know, were, have bullet holes through them or all types of, mm-hmm. uh, stuff that was upgraded, tech that was upgraded and disposed, disposed of. So there was tons of parts that I had, uh, access to. Um, and so I thought, you know, I'm not going to let this Halloween pass by without a little fun. So I found a couple of uh, LED rings and I built my own power supply and hid it under my uniform. And mm-hmm. so Halloween night, you know, there are folks sort of around getting dinner and trying to have a little downtime in between operations. I, uh, I made it so that my, my Iron Man arc reactor that was hidden underneath my uniform was, uh, controlled by a, a remote in my hand. So you can imagine the surprises I'm walking around the FOB, the, the Ford operating base and this, this, LED globe is slowly starting to get more and more intense underneath my uniform. It's kind of a, kind of a trippy sight, but folks around me loved it. And so it's sort of, you know, it, it's, you know, it brings a sense of, of calmness. It was fun for me, but it, it also helps, uh, you know, helps everyone remember, remind themselves of like, you know, what fun is when you're out there in those tough times. Yeah, definitely. I'll be sure to include links to, to your blog, to your projects, and, and in this project in particular. I think the other thing that surprised me about this one was that uh, you powered that arc reactor with a 13.5 volt battery. And I'm looking at a picture here where you actually cut open a 9 volt battery uh, and made it made a one and a half nine volt battery power supply, which I, I've never done that. I've never, I never thought to open up a battery and see what was in there. I yeah, would be it's, afraid. It's, it's sort of what I had at the time, right? I had like these weird LEDs that had a certain power requirement and I didn't have the exact thing. So I took apart a few batteries and just sort of made it happen. That's fantastic. Well, I really appreciate you chatting with me today. This has given me a lot of inspiration about how to apply these things, not only to, uh, to my personal life, but also at work. And uh, I really admire what you're doing down there. Hey, thanks so much, Scott. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week. 